Hey guys, welcome back to Clownfish TV. This is Neon. We're gonna talk about tabletop gaming. In particular, we're gonna talk about Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards of the Coast and a lot of the drama around uh, D&D and magic. And it's gotten so bad that the president of Wizards of the Coast has come out in an interview and she's trying to dispute a lot of the uh, the complaints that players have had about Magic the Gathering, about how D&D is apparently going to go pay to win, uh, that they're going to try to upcharge players with more online purchases, and uh, that uh, the company is not in a terribly good place right now. Uh, she even addresses the uh, debacle with race, you know, with them getting rid of race. And uh, I think it's a pretty interesting read. We're going to look at some of this here coming from GeekWire. Before we get into it any further, please subscribe. For more pop culture news, views, and rants, guys, almost 283,000 subs, uh, hit the subscribe button. We've been following the situation with Wizards of the Coast, with Dungeons and Dragons, uh, being an old head, being an old school D&D player myself. I'm kind of, uh, kind of shocked at the state of Dungeons and Dragons right now. While it's financially very successful, the game is virtually unrecognizable from the one I played when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, and now, players are angrier. <laughs> you know, it's not just all the weird politics of Wizards of the Coast, but players are angrier at Wizards because they're talking that they want to monetize individual players more, that they want to, you know, offer in-app purchases. And this shouldn't surprise anyone because the person they put in charge came from Microsoft, and that's what she did. The president of Wizards now, uh, Chris Cox, Chris Cox came from Microsoft. These are video game people. So they're going to look at D&D &D and Magic as being a video game. And uh, how do you make a quick buck on video games? You upcharge people with in-app purchases. So yeah, let's let's talk about where Hasbro's at right now, where Magic is at right now. If you missed that video, uh, apparently Hasbro stock is in the gutter right now. And Market Watch, Market Watch was actually accusing them of making too many Magic the Gathering cards that they were overprinting, that they were trying to cash in on the pandemic because... Uh, Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering were both selling very well because you're in your house. You're locked in your house. You're going to play board games. You're going to play games. Uh, people were watching on Stranger Things and they were getting into these games. And now uh, now it seems like some of the magic has worn off of, of magic. So this very interesting interview popped up the other day. And this is the president of Wizards of the Coast, Cynthia Williams. And she's basically disputing all of the uh, grievances that players have had over the last couple of weeks. And I got to wonder if her job isn't on the line because Wizards of the Coast is being blamed for dragging down Hasbro stock by mainstream media outlets, right? And if somebody's going to get tossed overboard, it's probably going to be her. Let's be honest. So yeah, this is coming from GeekWire. Right out of the gate, they ask her about the revenue. They said, at the start of the year, we were talking about how 2021 and 2020 have been record-setting revenue years for Wizards of the Coast. How did 2022 wind up going? She says, we're on pace for Magic the Gathering to be Hasbro's first brand to hit a billion dollars in the fiscal year. Again, possibly due to overprinting cards. We've had a record-breaking year. The five tentpole releases for Magic have all hit $100 million. Of course, the acquisition of D&D Beyond uh, has been a real aperture opening for our ability to see what our fans are doing in the world of D&D every day. Whether they're playing at home or not, we've seen that registered user base grow more than 20%. We're having a phenomenal year. Again, not really answering the question quite the way I think they were asking, which is, how does it stack up to previous years? Are you down? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, they, they are down. But th she's not saying that. It's very corporate. So you're getting a better idea of how people use D&D &D beyond now that it's in-house. Exactly. The access to see characters they're creating and what they're doing is giving us more data on a digital basis versus doing surveys, which is how we've learned more about our players through the years on the analog side. Again, this is all case building for these, these rumored uh, upcharges, these uh, digital transactions. They want you probably to register yourself, your character online you know, so they can start upcharging you. It reminds me of how the achievement system, this is them, on Xbox has been a big deal for gathering player data. Uh, speaking of which, as a former Xbox employee, what do you feel like you brought from that to your new job at Wizards? Um, 
yeah, she's talking about video games. And again, they're trying to turn Wizards into a video game company. They've already done this. They're, they're doing a G.I. Joe game right now. Uh, she said, when I started talking to Chris Cox, uh, Hasbro CEO and the former Wizards president about joining Wizards of the Coast, I knew the fan base for Magic and D&D are more fanatical than Xbox or PlayStation fans. Oh, Cynthia, you have no idea. That's really what I brought was the understanding of the stewardship that you have for these brands. Again, this is very corporate. What's Wizards' strategy going into 2023? Um, we're excited about 2023 about several things. Certainly, there's the movie. Uh, I've seen it twice now. It's funny. We're going to introduce a whole new group of people to the game and let them come into this world. Okay, on the Magic side, we're going to continue the 30th anniversary. In summer, we have massive uh, universes beyond set for Lord of the Rings. Uh, we have new people coming with Warhammer 40K sets, yada, yada. Again, not answering, like, what, what are you actually looking forward to? This is like product, right? Where do you see, they're trying to get, they're trying to get her to admit, and she's being crafty. They're trying to get her to admit that, yeah, we're going to bleed the fans dry. You know, that's just what we're going to do. Yeah, and here, here, here it is, guys. Here it is. Here's what you're waiting for. Again, defending these microtransactions. The big trend we're seeing is the importance of having both a digital and a physical expression of things. We call those hybrid players, people who play both. There's another lesson I took from Xbox that I'm carrying with me. When you give people more ways to play, when you meet them where they are, they play more and they spend more. I added that. We're seeing that after we acquired D&D Beyond and having both the uh, TCG Magic and the online version of Magic, those hybrid players are the most satisfied with the game. They play the most, and as a result, they spend more. They spend more. There it is, guys. We see the importance of continuing to develop the ecosystem to have both the physical and digital expression as one of the key trends for tabletop going forward. Okay, now we're, now, now we're getting into it. What's your position on the recent accusation that the heightened rate of magic releases have been flooding the zone, so to speak? It does seem that there's been so much more magic coming out this year than any other year. From my vantage point, there are two things. Number one, for the last three years, we've done six tentpole sets. It's not that there are more big releases. What is true is that for the past six years, we've been learning more about our player base. Part of what we've learned is that within magic, you've got about 80% of the population that considers themselves casual players. That insight led to the introduction of commander decks. Uh, we've learned about the people who love to be collectors has led to the collector booster set. Uh, when we talk about there being too much magic, one piece of it is for that the same number of releases, we've added more SKUs. Not that we expect someone to buy all the SKUs, but we expect someone to buy the SKUs that meet their play style. What we're seeing is that about a third of our growth is coming from that segmentation. Uh, now, the second piece is also true, but we're trying to correct it in 2023. The supply chain challenge, supply chain challenges going all the way back to the pandemic carried through for us this year. There were sets that we expected to release earlier that got delayed. In one case, it was a glue that we needed that we couldn't source. We ended up with two big sets released within four weeks of each other. Should be closer to two months. That's not ideal. That's not what we wanted. Again, when you've got Market Watch calling you out saying you're printing too many magic cards, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good look, guys. And I've actually talked to dealers. I've talked to uh, people that own game shops. And they said, yeah, there's too much. There's just too much. Um, with the recent... Okay, now they're bringing G4 TV into it. With the recent cancellation of the G4 cable network, which was partnered with Wizards at one point to produce original live play content, where do you see live play fitting into Wizards' strategy going forward? Um, so they're talking about it being face-to-face -face interaction. I said, so when you think about streaming and content creators, we had great success with the World Championships and the 30th anniversary in Vegas. That's key. If you're asking about esports, that's not a place where we're going to continue to invest. At my time at Xbox, that's all she talks about is her time at Xbox. You noticing a trend here, her, her video game background? I had streaming platform Mixer for a very short amount of time, and that did very, very well for you, didn't it? Mixer did so well. I do believe in the power of being able to watch other people play. And there are a number of things we're working on to give people an opportunity to stream. We appreciate the value and success of Critical Role. When we look at D&D Beyond, our digital product, we think that you should think of it as the front door. You should be able to come there and find what you're looking for, including a watch space. So what, they're going to add like streaming, like Twitch style streaming? A topic of conversation on social media has been the recent announcement that D&D will move away from the term race and use species instead. Can you talk about what motivated that change? 
What I can say is this. We're continuing to evolve how we think about this space. God, she's not giving any answers to anything. I talked before about how important diversity is to us and how we see that as a strength. We do think that this was language that was not necessarily representative of how we think about the term now, and the team felt pretty passionate about finding a replacement. We don't believe that a character's race predetermines things about them. So basically, just some people thought, I thought you were supposed to, you were supposed to survey your players and see how they thought about it. Because I think if you ask most D&D players, they thought it was a really stupid change in species is actually more offensive because now those characters are kind of subhuman. Uh, it's an interesting choice of words, they said. She says, I think it's important to remember that one D&D, a new publishing initiative, buy it, buy it, buy it, is at the point of playtest. I don't think that we have finalized that the words will be species. It's a word being tested. Two things I got from this. The only two things I got from this. One, they're going to double down on digital because everything to them is a video game. She comes from Microsoft. And um, that they're really just interested in monetizing the players as much as they can. Individual players. She's giving non-answers. I think this is a woman who is getting grilled pretty hard uh, by the board, by Hasbro bosses as to why uh, you know her division is being blamed for the stock collapsing. And um, this just seems like she's trying to do some damage control. Uh, and I don't think it's gonna work. I, I'm gonna be honest. I think the damage has been done. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of media outlets, I'm surprised, are even like, yeah, this is too much for D&D to be like, you gotta do pay to win. You're gonna have to do microtransactions and all of this stuff. It's like, it might be time to play something else. And people are gonna move on, you know? If they don't like the product, they don't like the company, and they're not getting the warm fuzzies, because this does not, to me, come across like a woman that really cares about the product. She just cares about monetizing players. That's that's all I'm getting from this. And, uh, you know, she's going to be treated as such by a lot of gamers, I think. So I'm going to wrap this one up. Uh, please subscribe for more pop culture news views and rants, guys. We'll talk later.